All right. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for the uh, the first panel of today. Um, you know, I get, we get to be your warm up act, your wake up act after breakfast. So, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so, Alison Hitchens and I will start off, and then we'll be joined by our colleagues for. NCSU for the second part of this two-part uh, panel. So my name's Ian Milligan. Uh, I'm an Associate Vice President at the University of Waterloo. I'm presenting here with Alison Hitchens, who's an Associate University Librarian um, at the University of Waterloo as well. And what we want to do is talk to you today about coordinating data services in a decentralized environment, building a successful institutional RDM strategy. So part of the motivating um, rationale behind this presentation is to address, you know, why are Ian and Allison working together? Um, why are we bringing the Office of Research and the library together to work together on a project? Now, what we're trying to tackle collectively is the problem of research data management on our campus. Um, this is probably not a term that requires any introduction to, uh, to the audience here at CNI, um, but we're responding to a policy, the Tri-Agency Policy on Research Data Management, and the Tri-Agencies refer to RDM as the processes applied through the life cycle of a research project to guide the collection, documentation, storage, sharing, and preservation of research data. Now, I'm sure everybody here follows every individual twist and turn of Canadian higher education policy, um, and if you don't, um, I recommend that you do, um, because this is a Canadian-US organization. Um, but Particularly, we're responding to this data management policy, and I, it's a long document. It's actually worth reading if you're curious what other countries are doing in this space, but the germane paragraph is right here, that the tri-agencies, which in Canada are the funders of social sciences and humanities research, natural sciences and engineering research, and health research, collectively have come together and argued that research data collected through the use of public funds should be responsibly and securely managed, and B, and I always highlight this, where ethical, legal, and commercial obligations allow, available for reuse by others. To this end, the agencies are supporting the fair guiding principles for research data management and stewardship. And right now in Canada, um, across a very small portfolio of grants, unfortunately only five granting opportunities in this upcoming cycles, researchers are finally being confronted with data management plans. And we want to make sure when they see those data management plans, they know what to do with them. So accordingly, by March 1st, every Canadian institution that's eligible for federal funding needs to have an institutional RDM strategy. So that's why we're working together. But we tell our researchers that even if Canada had not gone down the RDM hole, that even if it wasn't the big evil tri-agencies telling you that you need to begin to think about sharing your research data, the litany of policies and procedures you've heard about yesterday and approaches suggest that you can't hide from the long arm of RDM requirements, that the National Institutes of Health, as we heard about yesterday, are rolling out new requirements, the journal Nature, PLOS, the Wellcome Trust, the EU Horizon Grants, Australia, et cetera, are all increasingly compelling researchers to think about their research data. Now, part of my portfolio is regulatory compliance, which is probably why I do this. Um, and the last thing we want our researchers to do is to think of RDM as a compliance measure. The last thing that we need is some jerk AVP coming to them and saying, hey, you have to do this, because if you don't, I'm going to find you in breach. What we are trying to do is articulate it positively. We're trying to use carrots, not sticks, and we're trying to really articulate a vision on campus that this new requirement is coming. Don't be afraid, because if you do what this requirement is telling you to do, you can be a better researcher. And I think this is probably familiar to everybody in this room. We are trying to convince researchers that if you steward your data, if you describe your data, if you preserve your data, and if appropriate, you share your data, they actually do help foster research excellence. That if you think about your data architecture at the beginning, you will avoid headaches down the road. You'll avoid that IP dispute. You might mitigate national security concerns. You might handle some of the ethical problems around the sharing of data if you thought about the architecture at the start. That you can access your older data and you can understand it, you can share it with other people so they can build on your work, and if we're all doing it, it's not the free rider problem, you can build on their work and they can build on your work, and crucially, you're protected from data calamity. Now, underscoring all this, and this, Cliff, Cliff mentioned this a little bit yesterday, we of course don't want researchers just putting data onto disk for no reason. That'll just sit around forever. We want people to think carefully and cautiously about what it is that they're choosing to preserve. 
Now, when it comes to tackling this problem on campus, scope is a bigger challenge because RDM doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's alongside a broader landscape and ecosystem of research support, including research IT support, research ethics, grant support. And at our institution, like I'm sure many in the room, we have a very decentralized organization. So we have a library IT, we have central IT, we have faculty ITs, and we need to bring it all together. And we have to do something more than just build a portal. Um, but we also don't want to step on other people's toes as we think about how to help researchers meet these new requirements. And so it was this context that we brought a team together to write a strategy. So our team was sponsored by I Central IT, by the library, by the Office of Research, um, Allison and I from the latter two. It's co-chaired by Allison and I, myself from research, Allison from the library. And we have representation across all the stakeholders, from IT, from the library, from research, from our faculties. We have a faculty member. We have a research support officer. And a plug to our consultants, Athenaeum 21, we got support as well. And I put this here. We actually never met in person. We just always met on teams. But we, if we had met in person, we would have had fun. So how did we, given this context, how did we rise to build the strategy? Well, first of all, we needed to know our audience. So we said, we got to find out what people think on campus about RDM. So we surveyed all our faculty, uh, which is about 1,400 faculty and a few thousand graduate students and staff who engage in actively research. We surveyed, we received responses. Surprisingly, for the once in my entire lifetime, more faculty than graduate students responded to the survey. Um, and we learned a few things. We learned no one size fits all across campus. Researchers are overwhelmed. They don't want to deal with RDM until it's too late. There's too many conflicting and confusing policies. They want training and guidance, but they don't want it to be required. Communication is key. Skilled staff in HQP are needed to exist to support new and existing requirements. And of course, analog data, paper especially, chemistry notebooks, et cetera, are also important and need to be supported. And so we got this needs assessment. We had our working group, and then we knew we had to consult even more. Um, but we had a timeline so we wouldn't get bogged down in endless consultation. But in addition to our working group, we also built an advisory group of researchers, faculty and staff from across campus, plus a postdoc and a grad student. And we built ad hoc focus groups. Let's talk to the data managers. Let's talk to the indigenous researchers. Let's talk to IT staff about the challenges that they face in their area and the opportunities that they see. So after all this consultation, what are we do going to do to coordinate our services on our campus? Well, in part, some of our principles, so we've developed our draft strategy. If anybody wants to see a draft of it, come talk to me and I can, I can hook you up. Um, you can make good bedtime reading. Um, but if uh, some of our principles reflect this landscape, that we realize that any RDM strategy needs to be about collaboration. It's a whole institution effort. We can't, no one unit can do it alone. And that will leverage expertise that's around the university and around our international and national cons consortiums and partners. And then crucially, ease. I'm an ease guy. Um, we want to make it easy for researchers to adopt RDM practices. We want to make it so easy that they become compliant with RDM policies and they don't even realize it. We've tricked them into being compliant and they don't need to ever get a mean email from anybody from compliance. And I'll turn it over to Allison to talk about the different options that we've had to, to bring this together. Great, thanks Ian. So in addition to having some principles laid out in our strategy, our very first strategic directive is around coordination. And I've included um, an image here that Athenaeum 21 had put in our needs assessment report that really kind of points out those key stakeholders that Ian's mentioned over and over again, but also all those different people across campus, whether it's IT and data managers in the faculties and departments, um, whether it's other offices on campus, whether it's things like the Survey Research Center that provides services um, to our faculty. There's also a unit on campus that helps folks with data science. We have also their, our unit that helps people get access to Statistics Canada data. There's a lot of things going on across campus. And sure, we talk to each other from time to time, uh, but there's no real coordination effort. So the first part of our strategy is figuring out how do we actually coordinate these services? And so when Ian and I have been thinking about it, we just put them into three categories. I'm sure each of these categories does have many flavors of a, a center or a hub, a network and a, or a community, and a bit of a muddle. And so as Ian says, we all love portals. We can have a portal up that points people to our um, services, but that alone doesn't make a strategy. 
So we think about a center or a hub, it's got a lot of appeal because we're talking about something that's a more of a formal service partnership. So not just us talking together about these issues as we do right now or you know, when the Office of Research is doing a grant presentation, they might say to the library, hey, do you want to join our workshop and present on RDM? That's kind of what happens right now, but a more formal partnership with some dedicated staff that can actually lead the charge. They're not doing it off the side of their desk. They're being paid to, to make this effort happen. And being able to define some core central services that all of our researchers have access to, regardless of which um, discipline or faculty that they're in. We don't have an example of this for anything that we could think of on the Waterloo campus on, in, in any subject area, whether that be wellness, um, research computing, data, teaching and learning. Uh, so we had to look elsewhere. So I know that for, we gave the example here of the University of Toronto has their Center for Research and Innovation Support. I know McGill has their digital research services. Uh, Athenaeum 21 mentioned to us uh, University of Boulder at Colorado and some services at NYU and I'm sure um, you'll hear some more services actually from our colleagues coming up next that they're building towards. So um, this is something that would be new to Waterloo and there'd be a lot of things that we'd have to do to work towards it and make it work in our very decentralized environment. What we're more familiar with at Waterloo is the network or community. And so Ian and I have kind of defined this as like a committee, a working group, a task force, uh, whatever the, they decide to name it. It kind of helps coordinate activities across campus, but any funds are really kind of ad hoc or project-based funding. Um, it's a very distributed model, and you think about it, it's kind of voluntary. So we have our working group on bibliometrics. It has a list of stakeholders that are members. Um, but we don't have to have quorum at a, re at a meeting. You know, Ian's not tapping on people's shoulders if they don't show up to, to talk about bibliometrics. It's a little bit more loosely coordinated and, and voluntary. We also have associated communities of practice sometimes, which does help with the skill building, so it can be really useful. Um, so our bibliometrics practitioners, for example, um, meet outside of our working group meetings just to talk about issues with each other, you know, things on how to use the software, what things they're trying to, to solve. And we have other examples on campus, like the Wellness Collaboratory, where all the people that deal with student wellness on campus come together to talk. We've got things like our Keep Learning team, which started up during the beginning of the pandemic, but it's still meeting, which are things like the library, our Center for Teaching Excellence, our Center for Extending Learning. So we're very familiar with this network and community, but for someone like a chair, like Ian, I don't think he's probably even sending, you know, I don't know, we're gonna guess a percentage of your time, <laughs> Ian, that you spend thinking about bibliometrics. So it's a very different uh, story than what if you had a more formal center. And we wanted to recognize the muddle because it doesn't have to be a bad thing. There's a lot of issues on our campus where it's probably okay that we're all working separately and then just as issues come up, we reach out to partners, we talk to them, we solve it um, together. Uh, that happens all the time for many different things. But probably as our data management plans and later data deposit becomes more and more common for researchers to have to be looking out for services, that's probably not a place that it's going to work for us. So we need to learn to collaborate in different ways. There's lots of good collaborations and partnerships on campus, um, but it's not collaboration to the point so much of coordination, of moving together all in the same direction and, and, and building services uh, together. So we've been paying attention to the, the work that OCLC Research has been doing on the social interoperability um, of research, the research enterprise that's really looking at that human connection. How do you actually get folks working together um, across different departments and units? And that involves individuals working together as well as looking at the priorities and strategies that, that units have. And recognizing um, that universities are really complex um, spaces with lots of different dynamics, lots of different priorities, funding models, and that, that you're trying to um, work together. And so Rebecca, let me borrow this slide um, from a recent presentation we um, did at the Charleston conference that really points out strategies and tactics that we're pretty used to if you even think about things like project management, but thinking of them in, on a much grander um, scale around securing buy-in, making sure we're talking to people. And I think for me the key one on this slide is being sensitive to timing, that not every group that you talk to is ready to talk to you right now. Uh, they might be something that, you know, three years from now, they want to come back to the table, and that's okay. This is not something that we're going to solve um, overnight. So 
start working with the people who want to work, build that credibility and trust over time um, with other people. Finding those connectors, why are people interested in talking to you, especially if it's someone you don't work with um, all the time, and making sure you have people in place to actually work on these relationships that are giving this some careful thought and energy and um, moving this forward. So as we're thinking about this, it felt like we've been working for about a year or so on our strategy, and that all sounds great on paper. There was no one you know, jumping up when we did our town hall saying, you can't coordinate, that sounds horrible. Why would you want to do that? There's no pushback on that whole concept of coordination collaboration. But now we actually have to implement it. We need a roadmap, we need to move things forward. And so we're gonna to have to really have a good, strong value proposition to talk to people about, about why this is an all hands on deck thing, why this isn't just a library problem or just an office of research problem or just an IT problem. And so we need to buy, get buy-in on the strategy implementation, which I think is a lot um, more work is going to be than getting buy-in on the strategy itself. Uh, and so building shared understanding, having a new round of conversations to say, hey, when you listen to the strategy presentation, what did you take away from that? How did you interpret that? What did coordination mean to you when we were talking uh, about it? Because um, I know from hearing things, some people walked away from our, our town hall presentation saying, oh, they're going to hire a whole bunch of IT staff to, to work on RDM, which was not necessarily the message that we, were, that we were giving out. So we need to have those conversations. What did you hear when we said these words? So our next steps for us here at Waterloo is finalizing the strategy so that we can post it. That's the compliance um, issue, but with the recognition that anything that we do post is going to change over time. We need to work on that actual roadmap for the strategy goals and talk about things like resourcing, which is always a fun topic on, on campus. How are we actually going to find the resources to move these things forward? What kind of coordination model, the ones we presented, is going to work for us? and probably recognizing that this is going to be a phased approach, starting with the partners who, who want to work with us. And I think, really importantly, expanding that circle of conversations. We've talked to a lot of people in the last year, and I think we need to go back to those people, absolutely, but also think about who haven't we talked with. There might be people we've talked to, perhaps just pre presented to them, not very many questions, went away, thought, thought that was that went great, but how do we actually have conversations with them now? What are the uh, service providers that we've mentioned that we actually haven't sat down and had a conversation um, with? We just kind of have them mentioned in our, as, in our thinking. So expanding that circle of conversations to that coordination. So what we're hoping for in the next 10 minutes uh, before the next presentation is to have some discussion with you. Um, of course, we'll be happy to take questions as well, but also some questions for you to think about. What have you been doing on your campus? And it could be research data management related, but it could be related to teaching and learning or, or wellness or any other thing on your campus where you've had to get units to collaborate together. What's worked for you? What are the challenges you've encountered? What are your sticking points? Is there a particular model that either appeals to you or found has actually worked? And how have you involved your researchers have been planning those activities? We've used them as advisory board. Um, have you gotten them involved in the actual planning of the um, services as you roll out? So those are suggested questions. They're not the only questions, but please feel free to come up to the microphones and uh, join us in our conversation. Thank you. So I have a, a different question on, than on your list. We've just been asked to um, put together a, a cost model of what doing this work is costing us. And we haven't even really defined what it is we're doing yet. So I'm wondering if you've kind of worked with costing models or how you've been thinking about that. I believe that is on the uh, to-do list uh, coming up in January. I don't know, Ian, if you want to comment on that as well. Yeah, I, I just add that the, the critical thing is scoping services, right? You know, if we would have some faculty when it comes to a data management plan that would truly believe, well, some of them truly believe that the library should write the data management plans, um, which is not a good idea because it's going to go to merit review by disciplinary reviewers. 
Um, but I think that's it, right? I mean, is it a level of service where you can sit down, have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with your data management plan, and they're going to work together, and you're going to have this great you know, final product that you're going to sail right through peer review with? So, I mean, if you want to scope that level of service, that's a higher level of FTE count than, you know, if you're doing the help desk model of you know where you're going to contact. And an even lower one would be if we did more the network model of we're going to get people together, we're going to build a community of practice, we're going to leverage existing resources and find ways to help, you know, we've got data managers all over campus. I think we could gain some by adding no FTEs and just having people talking to each other and knowing when they get a query. I don't know that, but I actually know that there's someone in engineering who can handle that. And, so I think it really is setting reasonable expectations around what service you'll scope and then the, the requirements come out of that. So good luck. <laughs> so I really appreciate the comment that you made about that the timing is important, that you may start by planting a seed and coming back to it. But have you had the uh, experience, and this is what I'm experiencing at my campus, is that there's been these territories drawn. You know, like the Office of Research has their territory, IT has their territory, and then the library is always trying to build those bridges. And so um, if you've met any kind of like territory, what advice would you have for overcoming that? Because I really feel like it needs to be those three main groups and then the other supports coming together. I, I mean, we're not going to solve this problem in isolation. So what advice would you give me? It, I think part of that is that being able, I think, as libraries to talk about what we're bringing to the table and, and how it's maybe a value add or an en enhancement. So try not to, and I, I know that people can get put lines around their things, but trying to think about it, it's like, we recognize here's the great service that you provide, which is fantastic. And can we add some component on, on top of that? Or and like you might need to change the language a little bit, um, I could see around that. Um, and sometimes it really is building that up over time. So I think that one of the things from my perspective at University of Waterloo that's really helped us in the library has been that working group on bibliometrics, which has been around since 2013. Uh, so we might not have had as many conversations maybe in the past with the Office of Research, um, but because the library has been part of that working group since 2013, and they're kind of used to talking to us now all the time about uh, bibliometrics and research impact, when we started to get here, um, kind of the echoes about uh, a policy on research data management coming out um, from the tri-agencies, we started being kind of like this little broken record, reaching out saying, oh, hi, you want to talk about this? And maybe we should bring in IT as well and having those conversations. So this wasn't an overnight thing. I think it's been happening for a number of, of years where we just keep reaching out, keep reaching out. Can we just have a conversation? Can we sit down and talk to it? And then by the time then we were started working on the strategy, um, we've had a lot of groundwork of those conversations. So I don't want to suggest it's an easy answer. I think it's that kind of building um, trust over time through conversations. And as I think as um, Rebecca Bryant would say from the OCLC research, sometimes the timing really is, they've noticed in some institutions, waiting for the people to change. And that can be honestly be a part of it. And, and you have no control over that. But they have seen that in certain institutions where something just didn't happen with a per certain partner until the people at the table changed and then they were able to go back and have that conversation again. So it just has a really honest answer. There are times when there's certain roadblocks that are, that are hard to come on because, because different personalities and ideas and priorities come into play um, the, as well. The only thing I'd add is, is it's, you know, it's the, as Allison's saying, it's the real relationship between people. Um, so if you looked at our org chart, you know, you've got research, like research in the library only meet at the level of the office of the president, really, because we're under separate VPs. Um, so it really is, you know, setting up, making sure that I talk to, I talk to Beth, our UL, at least four times a year, like quarterly. Allison and I talk every day. Same with other units, as Allison is saying. And I think it's just building those relationships and not letting the org chart get in the way of, of effectively collaborating. Hmm? Hopefully folks are okay out in the hall there with that <laughs> crash. Just getting us here. Uh, hi, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So just in, in noting that the Tri-Council will be looking at the strategies for potential gaps um, whereby to inform future streams of funding, 
just wanted to ask if any, you know, have any gaps surfaced in your conversations um, that, you've, that you've had with the broader campus? Or is it basically everyone's just trying to wrap their heads around the strategy? Um, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. I think that there are probably some gaps if we went back to our, our needs analysis of, of, of figuring out. There's kind of some broad gaps that I think that our community, we had a lot of communication awareness gaps, so that's you know a solvable problem over time. Um, but I think there's, a, uh, I will answer it in this way, that there's some things where we really have to wonder, is that a service, is it something that we at Waterloo have to take on, or is it something that we should be talking to either Compute Ontario or the Digital Research Alliance of Canada about? So I think that's where, and I think, uh, we're going to be really thinking carefully as we go to something. There was something that Ian sent me yesterday, um, an, you know, an open source tool, um, I think from Los Alamos, about finding people's, uh, you know, um, research <laughs> around the web. And, um, and he's like, oh, maybe we should have this, uh, you know, open source .u .u .ca. I said, should we have that, or should we talk to Scholars Portal, or should we be talking to the Alliance? It should it be something at the level of our our national repository. So I think. That's something that we're also trying to think about, is making sure that we're not solving it as an individual institution and, and making sure that not only the tri-agencies are aware of any gaps that we see, but also that the Alliance and others are aware of it as well. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I just add the, you know, for a lot of what we're hearing, I don't think the tri-agencies will really go into, into the weeds on it. I think they'll, they'll see us in compliance. Um, but it's been useful for us to talk to researchers and getting the feedback, you know, hey, I feel like I'm overwhelmed. These applications are getting too many granular questions. I'm getting away from fundamental science. Um, so that's a useful thing to feed back to the tri-agencies, the tenor of the response. And then also for me, I found from the needs assessment that, you know, some of the feedback was stuff of like, you know, I wish you did this. And the response from IT would be, well, they should just open a ticket. And I was like, well, it's not like don't tell them to open a ticket. Like it's a, it's a symbolism of like how, how we actually engage with our faculty, which is, is not gonna be tickets. It's gonna be relational and making sure they know who to contact. So we've got two minutes left, so I'm gonna go over to this side. Or did Pascal, oh there, okay, I'll go down to Pascal on this side. Thanks. Hi, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I just wanted to share some of the things that we've talked about at University of Windsor. I'm hopeful that this um, effort will also lead to conversations about how we can improve the kind of ecosystem around this. You know, we need, we need innovations in the Canadian uh, uh, CCIV um, uh, in allowing data to be moved between repositories, um, research information systems, interoperate with ORCID and other things, and you know, maybe if you could just comment on some of the externalities that you might hope to see coming out of this process. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Pascal. We definitely, I think, you know, Ian talked a little bit to this in the scoping of, of making sure that as we have these conversations, we're thinking about those broader pictures, both broader in both in terms of the national picture, but also in the things that are RDM related, but also help other things. So um, ORCID ID, for example, is something that's not part of our RDM strategy, but certainly gets into that, you know, being able to talk to people on campus about things like persistence identifiers, whether it be their data themselves, their other, other work, and how those kind of might then fit into the national infrastructure. So I think those questions are important to us. We do have a research computing committee now on, on campus, and then we have some other, um, and then through the Ridley Metrics Committee. So partly it's how to get even those different committees talking to make sure that we're looking at those big picture issues that aren't just, that's all part of that research landscape and not necessarily just RDM specific. And I'm conscious of time. I'll just add, if you're a Canadian researcher, tell the, or I work at a Canadian institution, tell the tri-agencies about ORCID over and over again. Um, and my worry is actually, for those in Canada know, we did a common CV, this really awful federal platform that really alienated researchers from, a, even in some cases, applying for funding, very granular boxes. It, it, Google it, it, it's like a nightmare that needs to be seen to believe. But my worry is that we're, we're in Canada, we're in a response to that, and we're kind of developing simpler policies. And my worry is we're going, the pendulum is swinging so far to simple, we'll just get people to write bio sketches in their applications, and we'll just make everything lightweight, 
and then suddenly we're moving away from the opportunity to or kids, we're moving away from the ability to have like fulsome disclosure of a researcher's whole CV. So if you're in Canada, you know, talk to the tri agencies and let them know what you really want to see because if they hear it from a million directions, they'll, they'll do the right thing. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>